Okay, so in this mini lecture, we're going to cover a little bit of material that we didn't have time to talk about in the lecture itself. Uh, in particular, we'll be discussing the relationship between the idea of giving a name to a value by calling a function, the let special form for creating local variables within an expression, and the relationship between mutating loop variables in an imperative programming language and making recursive function calls in a non-imperative programming language. Okay, so before we get started, I would recommend that you type this program into Dr. Racket with me as we work through these examples. I think if you do a little bit of active learning with this, it'll uh, go farther than if you just simply listen to, listen to me talk. Okay, so let's begin by pretending that we never actually saw the let special form before but we still want to be able to bind variables to local names within some expression. Okay, so let's begin by recalling uh, the substitution rule, otherwise known as beta reduction, in the lambda calculus. So for instance, I can write a function abstraction such as lambda x produces x. And remember how su the substitution rule works is that we apply beta reduction with some other expression to a function abstraction. So let's remember how this works. We evaluate an expression here. So in, for instance, we have the expression three. And the way beta reduction works is for every occurrence of the argument to the function, so in this case it's x, we substitute x with three. So after beta reduction, we would have the expression three, and there's no further evaluation that needs to happen. Let me write another example of this. So let's do lambda, and this time I'm going to call it x2. Uh, you'll see why in a little bit. And let's say when we call the function here, we will add 9 to the parameter. And what we'll do is we will perform substitution with the expression 4 times 4. So what will happen, at least in, in Racket, is that we will first evaluate the expression 4 times 4 to get 16. So let me take the function here, because we haven't yet called the function. We've simply evaluated the argument to the function. And then when we perform beta reduction, all occurrences of x2 will be replaced with 16. So we'll have plus 9, 16. We evaluate this expression, and then we end up with 25. So something to notice here is that within the context of the function as it's being evaluated, so after we've performed beta reduction, in some sense, x2 is synonymous with the argument that we passed into it. So it's almost as if x2 is a local variable that we bound to the value 16. Okay? So I would put it to you that this is sort of morally equivalent to a let expression. So let me write the same sort of thing that we have up here, but using a let expression. So what we would do is we would have let, and we'll do x2 is... Um, times 4, 4, and the expression that we're going to evaluate with x2 bound to 4 times 4 is going to be, what did I say, plus 9x2. So notice that the body of the let expression, that is after we bound x2 to 4 times 4, looks exactly the same as the body of the function after we've called the function with argument x2 to 4 times 4. So, I would put it to you that binding a value to a name with let is morally equivalent to binding a value to a function argument through function application. Okay, so this is this is an important point, so I'm going to put a box around it, just like so. Okay, so with this in mind, let's revisit our Euclidean distance uh, function from lecture. So recall, we had lambda xy, this will be the square root of the sum of times xx and times yy. And in lecture, we saw how if we wanted to give the square of x and the square of y, their own name. We can use a let 
uh, left binding for this. So let's do that. We have lambda x, y, let, um, no, like so, x2 is times xx, x, y2 is times y, y, and then our body will be square root plus x2, y2. Okay, so just to convince ourselves that this does the right thing, let us call both these functions here. So we will apply three and four. And three and four. Oops, what have I done? Oh, counted my parentheses wrong. And I did the same thing here. So that should be closed like that, and then like that. And they produce the same thing. So Euclidean distance of the vector pointing to three and four is of course five. Let me just roll this back a little bit just so we have the, the functions themselves. Okay. So let's give x2 and y2 local names like we did with let here, but instead we're going to use the function application approach. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the interior function, sorry, the interior expression here, and sort of build up what we need growing outward. So we're going to have some sort of expression where the innermost thing to evaluate is square root of the sum of x2 and y2. Okay, so where does the identifier x2 and y2 come from? Well, if we use a let binding, remember it's in sort of the head of the let binding here, sorry, the let special form here. But if we're doing function application, our only choice for x2 and y2 is that they are the arguments, they are the parameters, if you will, of a function. So it seems like a thing we should do is create a function who's ha who has arguments x2 and y y2. So we have something like that. And unsurprisingly, what we can do is we can take this function that we've written here and apply, oh, I don't know, why don't we say 9 and 16 to it? Right, so we're performing function application on the function here with these two arguments, 9 and 16. And if I run it down here, what we will see in the lower half of the window is that we get an expression back, which is 5. Great, except that when we're writing our function up here, we don't want to necessarily always call it with nine and 16. A thing we want to do is call it with the product of x and x and the product of y and y. So instead of nine, let's do times x, x, and similarly times y, y. Now we have to ask ourselves the same question once again, where does x and y get bound to? Well, remember the function we're writing here is the Euclidean distance function, where x and y are the arguments to the function itself. So it seems like the thing that we want is exactly this. Let me see this formatted. So let's look at what this function does. This is a function that takes two arguments, an x and a y, and then calls another function, which just happens to be defined inside the function, that takes two arguments, which we pass in the square of x and the square of y. And when we call the inner function with square of x and square of y, it computes the square root of the sum of the two things that gets passed in. So you can kind of see how, well, actually, before let's go any farther, let's perform function application on this function. So let's call it with three and four. Have I done something wrong here? Oh, I did do something wrong. We need to perform function application on the inner function. There we go. So now we get the thing that we expect to see. So this is a function that has an inner function that has, it, has the, the product of x and the product of y with itself applied to that inner function. So I missed a parenthesis there. Okay, so what we've seen is this, right? We can give a name 
we can associate a name with a value without using the let special form by wrapping the expression that uses the locally bound identifier that we want inside a function that gets called with what we want bound to the argument here. So in this case, once again, times xx gets bound to x2 within the scope of this function here. And similarly, times yy gets bound to the parameter y2. So this is a pretty useful way of thinking about things. I hope you agree. Let me uh, I'm just kind of cease the function application there. So the way that we're thinking about this is essentially to bind a value to a name, call a function. That's sort of the lesson from what we've seen so far here. Um, this is also useful when we started talking about turning iterative algorithms into recursive ones. So let's recall slow add in Python. So let's look at what the loop does in lines three and four of our function here. So for each iteration of the loop, what we do is we mutate the value of m and n to have new values. So every time we go through the loop, m gets mutated to m plus one and n gets mutated to n minus one. And of course, back in racket land, we're not allowed to mutate values. But let's see if we can think about how to implement slow add. And we saw how to implement slow add. But let's think about it in terms of sort of this rule that I just gave you down here. To bind a name to, uh, to bind a value to a name, call a function. So let's start by writing define slow add mn. And we'll have some body that we haven't seen before. But remember that what we're doing back in, in Python land is essentially is we're rebinding m to be m plus 1 and rebinding n to be n minus 1. So a way to think about it is to rebind a value to a name, call the, the function once again. So hopefully, if you believe the first thing that I said, to bind a value to a name call a function, you also believe that if I want to rebind a different value to the name, you can recursively call the function that bound those identifiers locally with different values. So recalling how slow add works, we're gonna to have to do something that depends on slow add, where we add one to m and subtract, well, let's, do that just for consistency and we will subtract like that. We can see how this idea of rebinding names by recursively calling functions means that this recursive call just sort of fell out naturally from how we thought about it. Right? So we're most of the way there. So why don't we just wrap up writing this function once more time, one more time. You may recall that the way that we figured out what the base case was, was we would look at the condition we decremented n enough times that n is now zero and then in that case we return m so let me switch back to racket here so that's our base case that we just sort of get for free by considering uh, loop analysis so we will write if n is zero we said we produce we produce m otherwise we recurse by rebinding m and n to these new values okay so let's try slow add, oh, I don't know, three and four. We should get seven, and indeed we do. So hopefully that gives you a different way of thinking about these three concepts that we talked about in the lecture. Uh, if you have questions, ask on the Piazza forum or send me a mail. Uh, otherwise, see you in class next time. Okay.